لو All right, let's get started. So um, first, we're going to start off with the quiz. If you guys, I put it on the chat. The other place is if you go to today's lecture on slide number two, you can actually see the link and just click onto it. It'll be a jot form. So let me share my screen for one second. There we go. So your quiz should look something like this, right? Just go ahead and put in your name, um, first name and initials. That'll be all right. And then um, here today, I give you three questions. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring it up how I'm going to ask you guys the questions. My goal is either I'm going to have like one question that covers the material from the lecture before. And then I'll, I might have a connecting question, which is currently here, my question number two. And then um, the other way I might switch it up is sometimes I might throw like a very easy question uh, about the today's lecture, right? That way I can make sure that you're reading yesterday's material and also you're, you're keeping up with the new readings that you should be doing. Um, uh, for right now, I'll let you guys, you can you guys can do uh, open notes, right? So you can look at your PowerPoints to answer these questions. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm not okay with like chat GTP or doing like Google searches trying to answer the question, yeah? So um, go ahead here. It's also like a writing exercise, so no pressure. Um, for the midterms, though, I do expect you guys to write your responses in a way where I wouldn't need to read the question to understand what your goal is, right? Like your goal should be to write it in a way to, to make sure you're really verifying that you're achieving the goal of the question. Yeah. So you got to make it clear enough where I wouldn't need, I don't need the question. Just from reading your writing, I could understand. Like here, you'd be like, you should tell me like um, when you pick an organelle and you describe this membrane, explain to me like, hey, this is the organelle I picked. It has this membrane. And what properties of that membrane help it perform the function? Yeah. All right. Good luck. And um, I'll give you guys a few minutes to write. For question number two, I did make three parts, A, B, and C. Pick A, B, or C. Just pick one. I'm okay with that. And um, question number three should be a quick definition. Yeah. All right. Good luck. I'm sorry. Where did you say we can get this? I logged on a few seconds late. Oh, it's okay. It's on the chat. It's also on the second slide of today's lecture, you can go, you can scan that.
versus Angola. Followed by Tunisia versus Mali. Can you guys mute that? Thank you. Uh, someone just submitted one where they talked about um, the vacuo. For the question number one, your question number two and three are blank, and you didn't put your name on it. So if you submitted the first word of your question one is vacuo, can you submit it one more time and then put your name on it? All right, one more minute. Submit what you get, um, what you have, and then um, we'll get started. All right, I'm about to get started. Please um, try to send in all your um, submissions and let's get going. All right, so today we're gonna be talking, uh, today really the big focus is enzymes, but I'm gonna have to do a little bit of background first. So we're gonna be talking about proteins, right? The, the, the big thing about proteins or the things that I want you guys to, to think about them is that sets them up, like they're set apart from DNA and from RNA, right? So DNA and RNA are like these 2D molecules that they, they basically just hold the information. They really, it, it's difficult for them to perform its functions as well as something what a protein can do. That big difference that sets these, these molecules apart is, is proteins are able to fold and create these 3D shapes, which lets them um, create really specific functions, right? So 
Here we're going to be looking at, I, I, um, I looked at the reading that you guys gave me where you guys were talking about the things you were interested in. Super interesting stuff. I'm going to try to trickle it in throughout the course. Um, here we're looking at a protein that's found. Um, it's part of the myelin sheet. It's the one that wraps around your neurons and basically creates like a little insulation. So when you have the electrical, uh, chemical electrical potential that sends the signal to the neuron, this is basically kind of protects it and helps transmit the signal. So there's just one disease where it's called prions, which is it affects the 3D shape of the protein. And by changing the 3D shape of the protein, you basically affect the function of that protein. So it, it doesn't work well. If you guys are interested in that, you can check out this paper here. On the left, you have the proper shape of the protein, what it should look like. Here on the right, you can see that um, you can see the alpha helix and beta sheets we're going to talk about today. They look vastly different. This big difference in, in their shape ends up change, having a drastic change in their ability to function and ends up leading to diseases like uh, mad cow disease. Um, part of that big emphasis is looking at 3D shapes. So here I actually went and I tried to fi uh, find a um, this protein. I was able to find like it's a model that got made through uh, X-ray crystallography and they're actually showing two proteins next to each other. So here you can see the alpha helixes, you can see the yellow, you can see a little bit of the beta sheets right here. You can see this molecule has a 3D shape to it. It has these alpha helixes, which we're going to get into it a little bit later. They have the ability of organizing amino acids in those specific spots. And by based on the properties of that amino acid, we can actually change how it functions. All right, so let's get started. Our quiz is done. All right, so again, the goal of today is I'm going to introduce the amino acids. We're going to talk about peptide bonds. After that, we're really going to go and try to appreciate a 3D shape of a protein. Then we're going to go through an enzyme. While we're going through the enzyme, you're going to see that I'm going to keep bringing back this idea of 3D shape and how the amino acids are very specific and carrying out specific tasks. And finally, at the end of this presentation, it's going to be talking about how do we regulate an enzyme. All right, so let's get, let's get started. So for this one, um, just a little warning, this is going to be a little bit different than the earlier bio classes where make you go into each amino acid and memorize it and give me the the the, um, the individual, like how to draw them or give me the charges. In this class, I just need you to know that there's four different categories, right? So there's four categories in the sense as um, we basically judge them off of one of these side chains, what's here in purple, right? The four categories of amino acids that we're working with are nonpolar amino acids, which means that in that side chain, these are basically uh, nonpolar, AKA they interact with um, hydrophobic molecules, right? Down here in green, we, we have these that are a little bit different. These are polar molecules. In this case, they're able to form hydrogen bonds. That means they're gonna interact with hydrophilic molecules. Down here, these polar molecules get subdivided into two other different categories. One of them is basic, which means they have a positive charge. You can see a little plus sign here, here, and here. The positive charges, it still means that these are, high, these are um, polar molecules, AKA hydrophilic, They'll interact with water, right? The only difference is they have the positive charge. The opposite to them are the acidic. Again, they're still polar, they're, they're hydrophilic, they'll interact with water. It's just that they carry a negative charge, right? As long as you know that big categories, if I ask you questions about how the amino acids work or if I want a specific amino acid, I'm always gonna give you the table, yeah? Um, so don't go too crazy into the amino acids. The only thing I do expect you to know is this little general structure here thing that we talk on the right. So this is kind of like the basic foundation of an amino acid, right? So here we have this central carbon, which is your first part, right? This is just kind of where we orient ourselves. This central carbon interacts with four different molecules, right? Things that don't change are, they all have a carboxyl group here on this side, which is kind of, we say that's like the back end of the molecule. And here on the left, you see in red, we have the amino group, right? That's where you see your nitrogen there. And that's normally what you call like the front of an amino acid. So kind of like for us, where we read from left to right, the amino acids, we read them from the amino group to the carboxyl group. In DNA, you guys remember, normally people always tend to go, always go five prime to three prime for pre proteins. It's always from the amino group to the carboxyl group. Right. And then on this other and this other end, you can find it the hydrogen atom. So 
carboxyl group, amino group, and hydrogen group, those are going to be consistent across all of them. So if here on the left you look, they all have amino, carboxyl, amino, carboxyl, amino, carboxyl, right? The big player, the thing that's going to make a big difference, or we're going to focus on, are going to be on these R, which is your side chains. So here this R kind of basically represents everything that we see here on the table, right? Things can go from being very simple, like here in glycine, you can see it's just an H, right? Or you can see something very complex, like an arginine, arginine all the way down here has a carbon chain and it has multiple amine groups, right? And they have a different charge. Um, but like I said, as long as you know the four categories, know whether they interact with water or they'll interact with hydrophil uh, hydrophobic molecules, that's pretty much the big stuff we're gonna care about, right? Um, cool, cool, okay. So that's the big thing about the amino acids. I'm gonna bring this table up a few more times. When I bring it up later, I also, I want you to keep that in mind that I'm gonna be bringing about how the four groups are gonna affect the ability of an amino acid to interact with something. All right, now how do we make a protein, right? So what we do here is we actually have to glue multiple molecules together, right? We normally put them in order. So um, the way this happens is that here on the left, we're gonna have, let's say our first amino acid. On the right, this R2 is gonna be our second amino acid. The way that these glue themselves is that we use the carboxyl. Let me see if I can draw here. I have a question. One second, guys. Uh, never mind. Um, so let me get back on this. Okay, so we're trying to glue these two amino acids together. The way that we're going to glue them together, what we're going to do is we're going to use the carboxyl group from the first molecule, right, which is this back end. And we're going to use the, 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 the front of the next molecule, which will be that amine group, right? Um, here, my, my color coding didn't go so well, but, you know, this is the amine group right there, right? As this reaction goes forward, what's going to happen is we're going to steal, we're going to use the oxygen group from the carboxyl side. So this, it's going to steal the hydrogens from the second amino acid, right? This reaction, it um, in theory, right, when we talk about like um, chemical reactions happening, we could throw these two molecules into water, and if we bounce them around enough, eventually this reaction might happen, right? You can get this to stick. The hydrogens will get stolen with this oxygen. This will leave as water. And now this charged molecule will end up using, will bind to the nitrogen, right? So this means we'll get basically this carbon that we care about over here, right? It's going to be this guy right there the nitrogen from the other one, it's going to be the one you're going to pick up on this side and they'll bond with each other. And it's how you'll basically get them to get them to get glued. If we try doing this, right, just chemically letting this happen, it'd be very difficult. You'd need a lot of energy and you'd have almost have luck to get them in the right orientation to get these molecules to bind. But in our case, we have a whole system, right, which we're going to get into later, which is going to be translation, where we use multiple complexes and we use RNA to help guide this process. And they basically help make this reaction happen a lot more efficiently um, and a lot faster. But here, I want you to be comfortable with what a peptide bond is, which is basically saying when we glue amino acids, that's all you have to worry about there. I need you to feel comfortable with what are the amine groups, what are the carboxyl groups, and then here it's that in order for this to get unglued, we can take out water. But because it's a chemical reaction and it can go one way, we can actually bring it backwards and it's if we bring water back into the system, right, bring in an oxygen to, the, to this one and bring in this hydrogen to the right, we can actually break these proteins apart. And you're going to see that later on in the PowerPoint, how we're actually going to go through one of those processes. All right. So here, again, focusing again on reactions, right? We're talking about how molecules can like covalently bond with each other, but we're going to basically swap part. I'm almost thinking like in my head, like we're swapping partners, right? So here on the left, we're going to be looking at this chemical reaction. We're looking at a hydroxyl group. And here we're looking at this carbon complex, a little bit of bromide. So everything on the left, for this case, we're going to be calling it our substrate. That's the thing that we start out with. As the reaction goes forward, what's going to happen is you're going to have this intermediate state, right, which is called the transition state. In this case, you're having electrons that are going to be shifting. It, it, they're binding from surrounding oxygen they're gonna start binding to this carbon, right? So it's gonna use its charge to try to create a new carbon. As this reaction is happening, because these electrons are like high energy and you're switching them partners, technically you're at a higher energy state. And that's kind of what you're keeping track here in the red. Because carbon 
normally only wants four partners. That's where it's the more stable. Here that you've put it in the place where it has five different binding partners, you basically make the molecule a lot, it's higher energy, it's more unstable, right? As it goes through this process, it then gets to this point where it shifts the electrons that it, it, it was sharing with bromide. It gives it to bromide by itself. Bromide can leave, and now it becomes more stable with oxygen, right? This electron transfer um, ends up happening is that we actually release energy. This molecule started out with a lot more energy as a substrate. As it went through this process, when it ends producing these uh, ends up producing this product, now it gets to a lower state, right? So this is an exothermic reaction, and you're losing energy into the environment. Um, so this would basically be a, a chemical reaction. If we, we were in the lab, we put these two chemicals, we put them in a beaker or we put them in like, oh, sorry, in a test tube, right? And we're like, Hey, we want to see this reaction proceed forward. That energy to get these molecules, to get them into that transition state is going to be dependent on literally the heat, right? Like what are the odds of these two molecules bouncing into each other in this right conformation? So we can try to trick it and make the reaction go forward by increasing the temperature. We can increase the pressure. We can try to increase their concentrations. Those are the things that will kind of help us um, increase the odds of this reaction happening. But we still have that big difficulty of trying to get it through that transition state, right? Because we need somehow energy to go from the environment to power up this reaction so we can go basically up this hill, right? Once we go up the hill, on the other side, we have a little bit more luck of it coming down and getting to the product side, right? And this is where those big player thing we're going to talk about today are enzymes. These guys are going to be are basically going to save us the trying to get over that transition state. So in this case, in red was the one we talked about before, right? In order for that reaction to happen, we had to use this uncatalyzed reaction. That means no enzymes present. We need all that energy input to get these molecules to bind. If you bring in an enzyme and you use that to catalyze the reaction, the enzyme they, 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 the protein kind of can help out in, in, in a few different ways, right? Some of the ways that they do it is they can grab onto, let's say, the two molecules themselves. It has really cool pockets. Grab onto them, puts them in the right conformation, right? Brings them right conformation, brings them closer together. Sometimes the protein itself, it could be like an intermediate par partner. So it'll, it'll use some of its amino acids to temporarily hold on to them. And it'll br help breaking some of the bonds to glue these molecules together. But in all the case, any of these properties that it can change to kind of help these molecules go forward, where we're, where the, the big net effect of, of what the enzyme is going to do is that it's going to decrease the amount of energy you need in order to have that, that bond going through that transition state to happen, right? So you can see here in blue, this should be where your enzyme comes in. So energy of activation is a lot lower. That means that if we had these two reactions at room temperature right now, one beaker, just the two chemicals, and we're like, Let's see how, how fast we can transition them to the product. While well, we did the same reaction, same volume, same amount, same room temperature, same pressure, but we add the enzyme on this side. Depending on um, that enzyme, it's going to make this reaction be more favorable, right? Just a little bit of random heat is enough to power it up and transition it to the product state, meaning that that enzyme is going to, it's going to be able to speed up the reaction by increasing the odds of it happening. Um, and kind of helping it push forward. Uh, da, da, da. So in that case, that big thing that the enzyme is doing is decreasing that um, the amount of uh, energy required to get it to the transition state to produce the product. So yeah, so the, the big question here is, oh, sorry, the big, the big thing here is that, sorry, let's go back. Um, the enzyme is going to decrease the energy of activation, right? So this EA, trying to get it to a transition state, that's the big net effect. Um, when it comes to the amount of energy that gets released, which is here down here, kind of shown in green, that's your delta G, right? The energy coming out of the system. In that case, um, whether you use a um, an enzyme in blue, or if you don't use an enzyme at all, shown in red, at the end of the case, when you're going in this reaction from this uh, um, carbon chain with bromide, so this thing's on the right, to so the product on the right, the amount of energy that you get out of the system is going to be consistent. So that change in energy down here from this side to down here is going to be the same no matter what. Um, I kind of think I'm going to redraw this drawing so that the blue line's a little bit fatter so you can see that it actually pops out and it's the same height here and it ends at the same place down here. Right? So delta G doesn't change. 
the energy of activation is the one that gets decreased by enzymes. And that's why they can increase the likelihood so mixed reactions happen faster. It also, they're more sensitive to happen. Okay, um, let me see. Oh. So again, if we look at it from the, uh, from the energy side, right? It's like, we need less energy to make this thing happen. If we look at it from like our perspective, like, hey, how fast is it happening? What we're gonna see is that if you don't add the enzyme, this is gonna take a longer time. It'll eventually achieve the reaction, but it just takes a lot a lot longer. Um, and then um, with the enzyme present, it should happen a lot faster. So if you guys remember from, um, from um, I think it's like a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of bio, some of these chemical reactions, they can go forward and reverse, right? So I think, let me see, I think I have one forward. Never mind. I'm going to talk that a little bit later. <laughs> so yeah, so speed of the reactions, enzymes speed it up. They have less energy requirements, but we still get the same energy output. Um, now here we're looking at an example of something that we actually see inside of our cells. So this is kind of one of my favorites when we're talking about um, getting energy out of the system. On the left, we have glucose, right? This is a high energy molecule. This is where um, plants basically use light to store energy in this molecule. We can then can eat the plants or we can eat, um, eat basically we can even eat just refined sugar in our coffee, right? That'll be that glucose, that's that high energy molecule and we need to get the energy out. In this case, we're gonna be using enzymes, right? Here is gonna be a hexokinase. What it's basically gonna do is it's gonna be one of the places where we actually input a little bit of energy to set up this molecule so we can eventually break it and take the energy out. Um, so the uh, hexokinase, what it's going to do is it's going to be it has pockets. It'll grab onto the hexokinase or your glucose, which is the sugar. It also has a pocket which can use to grab onto ATP, right? Within that pocket, it's going to help catalyze this reaction to make it happen and where it'll take the phosphate, right, from your ATP. So adenosine triphosphate will take the phosphate from here. And you're going to see we're going to glue it onto the last carbon of the sugar molecule. And then you'll have this right here, right? There's your phosphate group. And now you see we produced out ADP. Um, as it's doing this reaction, what it's gonna do is it's gonna grab both of the molecules. It'll temporarily do a little bit of chemical transfer down here. So let me see, um, no, never mind. I was gonna do examples, but uh, it'll grab both of these molecules, hold on to the sugar, hold on to the ATP, bring them together, the phosphate group that's gonna get released from the ATP, it'll get attached to the molecule. And when it's done, it'll basically pop them out and throw them away. But that amino acid is doing its fold in temporary binding, just how it started the process. That's exactly how the en that, that, that enzyme is gonna end the process. It's gonna look exactly the same, nothing's different about it. The only thing that change is gonna be that glucose is now gonna leave phosphorylated and your ADP is gonna leave with one less phosphate. But that enzyme is ready to go again. If you give it a new glucose, you give it a new uh, ATP, it'll do that process again. So they don't change themselves. All right. So let me see. So uh, yeah, I already went over the fact that the enzymes help lower this energy of activation. A higher chance of activism. So it makes it more likely to happen. Um, or help this makes it more, makes it happen faster. Uh, da, da, da. So normally the energy of activation, this is where really is going to slow down the reactions, but because we bring that down, technically we make it more favorable. And then here's the big the big bold thing. Make sure you guys bold this one down here. It's going to be that the amount of energy coming out of the system or that chemical being burnt off. Um, by changing from substrate to product, that doesn't change. So delta G, whether enzyme, no enzyme, you have the same value. All right, so here we go. So it should be summarizing all the points here, right? So enzymes, they don't get used up. That means that that protein, if it had 290 amino acids, it's going to start with 290 amino acids. It's going to end with 290 amino acids. There's going to be no change to it. We're not going to add any phosphates. We're not going to modify it at all. No covalent bonds happen, right? And basically, you can use it over and over again to make this process happen. Um, the other one is the enzymes don't make reactions uh, occur that would uh, normally not occur. So it's like 
when a reaction has, it, it tries to reach equilibrium, it'll be like, um, it'll try to, like right now I was showing you a reaction going forward, right? And we were adding the, here, you're adding this hydroxyl group to this um, uh, ethyl bromide, right? At the same time, this reaction, if there's enough concentration on this side, we can actually make the reaction go backwards, right? The more, if you added more, more bromide into the charge, we'd, eff we'd affect that a down scene point where this net reaction happens and you can push it backwards. The enzyme itself can't change that, right? So if I, by, just by putting the enzyme, I can't make a reaction proceed forward. The, the, the enzyme doesn't have any information that says it can only go one way, right? Meaning that the only way I can make the make sure that the reaction goes in one direction would be by me changing the concentration of the molecules, but the enzyme can't do it. Um, I believe in my, in my other class, I, I really talked about, um, it's one of my favorites, it's called an ATP synthase. And it's a really cool pump that it allows hydrogen to come through. And as hydrogen moves down the gradient, it twists and it makes ADP get glued to create ATP. The cool thing about it is if I put ATP in the system, I can make the ATP work backwards or it breaks. And as it breaks, it'll, it'll push hydrogens in the opposite gradient, right? So a protein is a machine that can fold, but it can't direct the, the, the molecules. Only the molecules can direct how the enzyme actually works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the other one is when we talked about changing that energy of activation, the enzyme itself decreases the amount of energy required to make it go over the hump. The enzyme doesn't provide that energy. That energy is still based on having, it's like a little bit of like, a little bit of heat that's coming from the environment or that, that random chance of these two molecules crashing into each other. Um, it itself doesn't provide energy. It doesn't have a power source. It doesn't use electrons of its own. It doesn't use ATP or anything. It, it's all based on how those molecules proceed forward, right? And yeah, the big one, remember that uh, enzymes don't change the delta G. The amount of energy is just based on how the substrate and product react. It's not based on the enzyme itself. And then, of course, these are the bottom two that we talked about. All right, so here is the next step. I'm gonna get a little bit more about this enzyme activity. So use this 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 slide as a, um, you can come back to this uh, this slide when we talk about that process we're gonna talk about for the next few slides. So in this case, in your notes, write down E is gonna be your enzyme, right? S is your substrate. And then in the initial steps, as we're making this reaction go forward, what we're gonna see is that your substrate's first gonna bind to our enzyme. So now we have this complex with these two letters together it represents the complex, enzyme and substrate. This is gonna be a covalent bond, right? So this will be that first step. On the next step, it's gonna be that once this binding happens, you're gonna see that a second step happens, which is the catalytic step. You're gonna see some cutting's gonna happen in your enzyme. It's not gonna be labeled your product. So this is what P represents. Now that you have this enzyme product complex, you're gonna see we're gonna have one more extra step and this is where we're gonna release the product. But the things they want you to know here is that your enzyme, just how it started here, that's exactly how your enzyme is gonna end at the end of this chemical process. The only thing that's gonna be different is your substrate is gonna become your product, yeah? All right, so here, down here, we're gonna have a little bit talking about the dynamics of these enzymes. Um, in this case, we're looking at how your substrate's being converted to the product, right? And like I said before, what really affects how a reaction goes forward, it's really based on the concentration of either your substrate or your product. Here you can see at the bottom in the x-axis, we're looking at the substrate concentration. That means we're, this equation, we're really loading it up on the left-hand side. The more substrate you put, you can see that we have, um, what's it called, um, a, uh, a faster conversion, or you have uh, the... the a faster, yeah, it's a faster conversion into making the product, right? Because here we're looking at the amount of um, of products per second. So this is literally how fast you're making the reaction happen. As you add more and more substrate, you can see the reaction gets faster and faster, right? So if we have the same amount of enzyme, the more substrate you add, that reaction really wants to go forward. It lands on the enzyme faster. The reaction happens, they let go. But that 
that enzyme preps again. And as long as a new molecule can jump in, it'll get the next one going, right? So the more substrate you add, the faster it goes. Until eventually here, what you're looking at the right, we're seeing how this is kind of curving and it's, it's, it's first super fast and eventually it kind of peaks out. And this is basically a limitation on the enzyme. Um, that rate of, of getting the enzyme to grab a molecule, do the cutting reaction, change it, drop it off, it takes amount of time. At that point, if you saturate all the enzymes, they literally can't go any faster. So at that point, you've, you've reached your cap. All right. So here we're going to go really into details about one specific enzyme called chymotrypsin, but I still want you to be thinking it overall with this big goal, right? The, the, the enzymes are going to grab the substrate, modify it, change it to a new product, and then they're going to let go. So here, this chymotrypsin, you're going to find it in your pancreas, and it, it, what it does is it helps you digest. In this case, what we're going to be looking at is um, how it actually breaks proteins. So in this drawing here, you can see chymotrypsin is going to be shown in green. The peptide or the amino acid we're trying to break is going to be here shown in this uh, um, chemical model, right? Here you can see this amino acid. Here's your R group. There's your amino group. There's that hydrogen. And here's your carboxyl group. And it's being glued to the following amino acid. So technically, it'd be a chain of amino acids. And what we're going to see it do is we're going to see this um, uh, chymotrypsin is going to break that polypeptide chain. Here, that polypeptide chain is kind of shown in red. That's going to be our substrate. We're going to put them together. Here's where we're going to have that shift happen. It's eventually going to cut that chain, and it's going to release these two fragments. All right. So sorry about this. I'll change colors one more time. We're still looking at the same enzyme, chymotrypsin. Sorry, chymotrypsin. And I'm showing you that enzyme here in orange. And in this case, that 3D shape of that protein is making this really cool binding pocket down here on the left. This pocket is going to have amino acids, right? Based, remember, there was four categories, polar, nonpolar. We have polar basic and polar acidic. You're going to change some of those amino acids. You're going to enrich the ones that you need in this pocket that will help you interact with this, um, with this specific amino acid, yeah? When it's holding to this amino acid, what I want you guys to keep an eye on is going to be at first, we're looking at um, the carboxyl group for this amino acid, which is this guy right here. There's your carboxyl group, right, for that first amino acid. This amino group is, is the drawing for the next amino acid, So basically here would be the blue one. Um, these amino acids that you see inside the orange section, those are the amino acids of the actual um, chymotrypsin, like the enzyme, which is going to carry out the reaction. What we're going to see here is that you're going to first going to create this bond, which is the the um, this bond here that was between this oxygen group and this hydrogen group normally makes a hydrogen bond to the, to this nitrogen. You're going to use that oxygen, and you're going actually going to bind it now to the carbon. You're going to covalently bond your enzyme to that amino acid chain, right? So temporarily, we're binding to it. So now, in this case, we're going from just being um, a substrate and enzyme. This is your enzyme substrate complex, right? We've stuck them together. The hydrogen that was uh, initially bound to this oxygen up here, now you're going to see it's going to go to this amino group here temporarily, right? Then it, this hydrogen is going to get dropped off, and it's going to be given to this amino group. Now that that amino group has a, has a hydrogen, this part of that protein can leave. Right? So this is already when you're looking at your enzyme and your product, right? What is my letter? Do you guys see my letters disappear? Oh, never mind. There we go. Sorry, guys. Um, wait, that's pretty cool. All right, I'll, I'll try to draw fast. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see here we've broken up a fragment, but like I said before, we can't leave this other part of the amino acid stuck into our enzyme. Otherwise, it's not a real enzyme, right? So in this case, um, we're going to look at this bond next. So now that we see it here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a new water molecule, right? This water molecule is going to be binding to that carboxyl group, right? It's going to give the OH there. 
You're also going to see that we're going to donate the hydrogen group to this uh, amine group, right? As we do this, we're going to break this covalent bond, and we're going to see we're going to shift that hydrogen from this side. We're going to shift it to create that first hydrogen bond we initially started with, right? At this point, you've let go. Now you have a product by itself, and you have the enzyme by itself. If you compare this picture down here, of what this enzyme looks like, and you compare it to the initial one where we started up here, you can see that we have these three amino acids and they have hydrogen bonds to each other. And that's exactly what we end up when we're done. Our enzyme started with our three amino acids and hydrogen bonds in an empty pocket, right? So as you can see, we've created a binding pocket. We can get a molecule to land in that pocket. We can temporarily glue that product to, all, to our enzyme we can cut it in half, we can bring water in, and we can break it off. So here you're really taking advantage of how amino acids are able to use that peptide bond to hold on to each other, right? When we make them, you have two amino acids, we normally take out water, and boom, you can glue the peptides together. And they have all five components, central carbon, their amine group, carboxyl group, and the R chain. When you wanna break them apart, you use this enzyme, you bring in the water, and you can actually break the chains apart from each other. Is that making sense? Let me see some thumbs up. All right, cool. We can do thumbs up. You can also do them in the comments. I'm trying to keep my comments open to see what you guys are asking, but let me catch up with you guys. All right. Let me see. I have one quick question. Does uh, concentration affect reaction rate? more than the enzyme, or does it depend on the reaction? The reaction rate. The reaction rate. It helps, let me see, does the concentration, the concentration of the substrate affects the reaction rate in the sense of how, yeah, it, it, it'll it help push it forward. It, it will help it speed it up a little bit because we can have the molecules interact. Um, the enzyme doing its task of making the reaction, in my head, it's like that bind, that's a consistent thing. It's just either we have it or we don't to help speed it up a non-reacted versus a reacted. Um, does that make sense how it's like, um, if you're looking at it from the concentration of the enzyme, it'll speed up the reaction in the sense of reacted versus non-reacted. If you change the concentration of the substrate, it will speed it up in the sense that it'll have more enzyme to play with, or it'll make the enzyme work a little bit faster. Um, but the direction of the reaction, which way it goes, it all depends on the chemicals, more substrate or more product. It'll push it forward with more substrate, more product, and you can push the reaction backwards. Okay. All right, cool. So chymotrypsin, we have the reaction going forward. Here I kind of redrew them. On the left is the first slide. On the right, you have the second set of slides. During this reaction, right, if we didn't have the enzyme at all, and the goal was like, hey, let's just break these two amino acids from each other, if we put them in a test tube, see how long it takes, right? And in order to power this reaction up, you see that you basically follow this black line you would need a lot more energy to get these two bonds to break. And the way that works is that if you have a chemical bond, um, do you guys remember, have you guys ever played with those little chemistry models that they, they have like um, the carbon, it's like four little plastic sticks and you kind of stick them with each other and they'll look like, like a V shape like that, right? They normally have a shape for how the elements link up with each other. In the case of you trying to break an amino acid, you need to have that carbon or that bond between the molecules, you have to break it. So one of the ways you can do it is you can bring in energy to make these molecules kind of, the electrons move away from each other. The other one that you can do is you can try to bend the bonds, like get them to shift away from that really stable state so you make them unstable. So without an enzyme, you normally have to have a lot of energy to try to help break that apart and bend these molecules. The big thing that the enzyme are going to help us with is they're going to do that. They're going to help bend the molecules or make them uncomfortable enough where it's going to be an easier way to transition from one state to the other one. And that's where we're going to go into that unstable state right here is where it's, it's helping breaking these bonds, right? When it's setting it up. 
And it's going to do it by either affecting the, the, the binding partners. For example, like carbon, if you try giving it five, it'll make it unstable. The other thing you can do is you can try to bend the bonds between the different um, between the different proteins. By bending it, you're going to make it unstable. It'll help it um, make it easier to break. And that's how you can basically bring down your activation energy, right? In this case, we can see that it happens in two steps. One step is going to happen here. The other step on this side is going to be here when you make this second bond, right? Um, and this will be because in this state here, you'll see that there's going to be this oxygen. It's going to bind here. Now you're going to have a carbon that has five bonding partners. Carbon only wants four. The moment you bring in that fifth, that shape of how carbons bind is going to be messed up. That unstable thing is what's going to help push this reaction forward. All right. So for this one, I'm thinking something like this is going to be your question for tomorrow or for next lecture. Um, so I want you guys to, to, to we're going to uh, look a little bit into this one. I believe I put notes for this for you guys in here. Um, so yeah, so for this one, I really, um, I was kind of reading through the text. I was hoping you guys were reading it too. I went through chymotrypsin today, right? So chymotrypsin, if we looked inside this binding pocket here, right, this orange section, for this one, what we'd find is that it, it, it has um, hydrophobic amino acids, yeah? So that means that if it has hydrophobic amino acids, oh, Jesus, hydrophobic amino acids, the proteins is going to be able to interact with have to be hydrophobic, right? So here we're looking at this one with this uh, carbon ring. If we go back up to this slide, you'll see here that phenylalanine, right? That's the amino acid we're looking at. It's part of that nonpolar group. So this enzyme, when it has that pocket made, because it has hydrophobic amino acids lining it, the amino acid it can grab has to be hydrophobic. So this enzyme will only work with, with hydrophobic amino acids. If we look at a different one, like for example, trypsin, that could be an op another example. In this case, it has negatively charged uh, asper aspartate, right? So if we go back over here, you can see here aspartic acid, it has a negative charge. So what did I say about uh, uh, acidic amino acids for, for that one, right? What, what are the things that we know? You guys can write them in the comments if you can. What kind of partners do they like? So nonpolar, like hydrophobic, polar, basic, and acidic, like what kind of partners for amino acids? All right, class participation. Come on, everybody, somebody. Yeah, they like, yeah, they like similar ones. Hydrophilic, exactly, right? So polar, basic, and acidic amino acids are going to like things that are hydrophilic. So in that case, when we go back to to this question here, right? If you're working with a trypsin, it has a negatively charged aspartic residue. It's going to be binding um, to hydrophilic molecules, right? That means that you basically need at least two of these enzymes to be able to break up proteins, right? You're going to need your chymotrypsin. It's going to be breaking up your hydrophobic stuff. You need your trypsin to be breaking up your hydrophilic things. Um, did I put the picture for this one? Yeah. So here on the sides, um, I normally write my extra notes. I also write notes down here. I normally try not to quiz too much on the side stuff. Um, but for this one, I, I kind of did want to ask you the question. Um, so yeah, so here you can actually see an example of the chymotrypsin. It's going to be binding to the, uh, the tyrosine. And here you can see trypsin. You can see you have the amine group at the end. That's going to be, it's going to have your charge. And it's actually going to help with this interaction, right? So um, with the aspartic aspartame, aspartate, ASP. All right. Here. Yeah. For the serine 195, right? When we're looking at it in chymotrypsin itself, 
you can see this is where, we're, where, where we, when we kind of follow this reaction, this is the amino acid that's part of your enzyme that's basically temporarily binding. And it's like a covalent bond with your per with your substrate. When this cut happens, you have the release. You can see that eventually it's the place where also you release the, the, the product. So that is what we kind of call like, this is like your, um, your active site. This is where you're basically having the procedure happen. So binding pocket is kind of where you bring it in. Your catalytic site or your active site is where you have the actual chemical or the covalent bonds being modified. So with that being said, we're going to jump to the next question here, which is these enzymes, they speed up reactions. They're super powerful, right? Um, like I wanted you guys to think about that in the quiz that we submitted this morning, that it's like the lysozyme has proteins that this is what they do. They grab amino acids and they will chop them up. It's very important that these molecules are regulated, right? The first level of regulation is going to be making them, right? So one of the big things that our cells do is that they have different methods of getting proteins to different organelles. The lysozyme, which is going to need these, these enzymes to cut proteins, they get put into vesicles, and these vesicles are being shipped directly to the lysosome, right? Oh, sorry, they go through the Golgi, get modified and stuff, but you know they go to the lysosomes. You really don't want these things floating around your cells because they would literally start chopping up all your proteins. That's one way of defense. The other way of defense is if you look at your nucleus, right? Your nucleus has your DNA. It has your proteins that hold your DNA wrapped around them. The last place you want one of these enzymes is to pop into your nucleus, start shredding your histones, and basically empty out or like display your whole DNA. Um, I, I found a really cool paper in Nature Science where they were talking about how um, there's an issue where they found um, these lysozymes inside the nucleus, and it was a, it was a it was a, a big correlation with how cells die, right? But um, I'll put the link for that one on. I'll probably put it on this slide just so you guys can take a look at it. If you want the papers I put up, it's just optional. If you're interested, you can check them out. But you have this higher level of regulation. Then at the enzyme itself, you have this more precise level of regulation, which is what I'm going to talk about right now. In this case, right, an enzyme is basically going to have what we call like the active site, which is what we talked about right now, where things are actually getting cut. In this case, one of the ways you can regulate it is by, it's called competitive inhibition. And normally what happens is you have a molecule that behaves or that, you know, will fit, occupy, or cover up the binding pocket, right? So this can be any other protein that might have, um, in this case, it has to be a, a hydrophobic amino acid, It'll fit in that pocket and maybe it won't let the cleaving reaction happen, right? But by being on that site, you won't actually let any of the proteins that you're cutting show up. So that's one good way you'll cover it up and basically you stop the enzyme from working. So that's one level of regulation. The other level of regulation is gonna be this, um, they normally call it non-competitive regulation, non-competitive inhibition, which just means that it doesn't bind at the active site, right? So it means that if the molecule's swirling around, technically it can still show up. But in that case, we end up having this other thing called allosteric regulation. And what that means is it binds somewhere else on that, on that enzyme. And by blocking there, it affects its function. Um, in this case here, they're showing a small molecule binding to this other pocket down here. So this allosteric regulation is the same thing as the regulatory site, right? And what it does is that by binding in this pocket, it literally causes a conformation or change in the protein. Like its shape gets curled up, it changes. And you can see here, in this case, it's actually closing off the, ox the uh, active site. By doing so, right, even though you bound somewhere else, you end up affecting the active site, and now you've turned this molecule, um, you've enhanced, sorry, you've turned off this enzyme, so you've stopped it from working. Um, in the book, you guys did a little bit of extra reading. It talked about different types of regulation. So in this case, this modification down here could be a small peptide, could be a phosphorylation, could be another protein that binds to the site, um, it could be a covalent bond, right? But normally the goal is there is to have something that you can control when you need it. It binds, turns this molecule off. When you when you don't need it, um, it, it's, it removes the enzyme's functional again. It does the job. A lot of the places where you're going to see this kind of thing is going to be for digestion. It's like we only really want to activate that system when we need to. The other one is also with like food production or amino acid production or sugar production. In that case, it's only when we're low on food or low on energy. We really want those enzymes to be working. When we don't want to, when, when we're high in energy, we don't want to waste our, our, our stored energy by creating ATP. We can actually shut them down. So in that case, the two regulations are going to be 
positive regulation and negative regulation. Yeah. All right. So that's the big stuff for today. Down here, I've added a little bit of my, my notes about what are the big, big key things about today's lecture. The other one is I'm, I'm going to try doing this a little bit more often where I'm going to put a list of key terms that I went through the class. Um, you should feel pretty comfortable defining these words. The other one is I also kind of want you to play around with them a little bit. It's like if, if you grab them, I, I, you, I put them almost in the order that they appear, but I want you to kind of group some of the words and how they work together. Yeah. And then um, any questions for today? Uh, I had one. Yeah. Gavin. Um, so, so like when we're prepping for next week's quizzes, should we be mainly focusing on the stuff that we learned today or should we look ahead to next week's notes to help us prepare for the quizzes for next week? So, so that's where um, today, I, today I, I did three questions, right? No, normally those are the three types of questions I like to make. One of them is, I'll normally ask a harder question or a more in-depth question or some kind of connecting question of the material before this class. So for example, today I asked a little bit about um, yesterday's class, right? Right. The other type of question is sometimes I'll ask you some way of you two connecting the two lectures together, right? The third type of question I might ask you is going to be something that like on the surface or something should be very simple to find for the lecture for today, right? Because my goal is the more you practice the material, the better it'll stick with you. So it's like, I want you to quickly glance over your notes from last week. I, I, you know, you you, you want to prep for my class by reading before it. And then the quiz for this, for today's lecture, it's like, if you power, if you just literally had the slides open for today's lecture, you should be able to answer this third type of question. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. And then um, one of the questions I got in the email was about how I, um, how I study or how I like to study. It's like, I prefer that you guys read through the, the book really fast, you know, read through the book the first time before you come to class. That way you'll see in class, what are the things that I really focus on about that chapter? And then you can make your notes specialized on, on, on kind of like what are the material I really focused on. Like today's, you can see, I went very lightly over the protein like itself. And it's more, I really wanted you guys to look at how they're functional as an enzyme. So the big focus with the enzyme, the proteins, it's like, to be honest, primary, secondary, tertiary, and coordinate. If you know those things, I'm gonna be happy just because it's like it's a little bit of background of how they get the 3D shape. Yeah, I have a slide in there. I leave it. I left. Uh, I left it hidden in here. But if you do want to go over it, I, I have it there for you guys, right? But it's like low background. My big focus is about this big mechanism of how they change the, the energies. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Good to go. All right, going once, going twice. All right, so, all right, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we get to see each other next week. If not, expect an email from me at the latest Monday morning, letting you know if we're going to do an on-campus thing. Yeah, all right. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.